introducing you to Missy Cummings, who is an, a professor of engineering at Duke, um, who is the director of the Humans um, and Automated Lab at MIT, um, and is just generally an expert in robotics, in the ethics of technology, in uh, the sociology of technology, in so many things. And today, we're going to be uh, particularly interested in her expertise on drones and um, automated um, weaponry, automated vehicles of all kinds. Um, so we're really excited to have her here. I would be remiss if I didn't add that Missy spent 11 years um, as an officer in the Navy and as a pilot. She was one of the US Navy's first female fighter pilots. Um, can you tell everyone what your call names were? So you always, you don't generally have just one, but uh, my, the last one I had was Shrew. <laughs> and uh, and I, I, that was my favorite. And the one before that was Medusa. <laughs> So awesome. <laughs> Excellent. Well, this is a tutorial session, so I'm going to very quickly turn this over to Missy um, for the tutorial aspect of all of this. Um, she will give a presentation, and then I will ask her a couple questions, mm -hmm. and then I will turn it over to you guys to mm -hmm. ask your questions. So uh, with that being said, Great. let's get right into Great. it. Great. So as you know, if it's a tutorial, it's really like giving you a little bit of a mini lecture. So uh, I was telling Megan earlier, um, it's fine if you text, it's fine if you sleep. <laughs> you know, I, I, I'm pretty used to it, uh, but I think you'll pay attention. <laughs> I will be very offended, though, so please don't do that. <laughs> okay, so I, let's just have a brief history of humans and automation because that's really where the crux of my research is. You know, around the turn of the century, this was the major form of transportation. And when the automobile started coming online, I mean, it was seen as a niche technology, nothing that was ever going to take off, certainly nothing that was ever going to replace the horse and buggy. And we all know how that turned out. Mm -hmm. Elevator operators came online shortly after that. And in fact, today there are still a few left. You can go to some buildings in Chicago where there's actually a person who will get you from floor to floor. It actually tur turns out that it takes a lot of skill because they actually have to sense when they're coming up to the floor and how many floors they pass, so it's a lot of concentration. There will be no texting while you're an elevator operator. <laughs> uh, but that went away, and again, people were just askance when the first automated elevators showed up because they couldn't believe that a human could be replaced in that capacity. But even more recently, uh, Wall Street traders, or really financial traders anywhere, have, they've been a phenomenal amount of the commerce in this area has been turned over to computers. Algorithms can trade much faster than humans, uh, for good or for bad. I mean, there's been some implications in some of the recent mini crashes where the automation got out of control. And I actually have graduated several students who work on the back end of this now. And frankly, uh, I'd like to know where my students are working because I'm not investing with that group. <laughs> <laughs> and then lastly, uh, in this domain, fighter pilots, which I know a lot about, and I'm going to show you a couple pictures uh, in a second to give you some insight to that. But this is a group of people who also thought until recently they would never be replaced. And Israel has just said that in 40 years, all fighter pilots will be robots. And uh, the US is, we're, we're very much a cowboy independent culture. We're going to hang on to that warrior bastion as long as we possibly can. But even so, the US one day will be all robot in terms of fighter bomber pilots. So let me give you a little bit of inspiration. So how did I actually get here in front of you? So I was one of the first female fighter pilots. And the reason I was in that first group is prior to flying F-18 Hornets, which you see in the picture in the upper right, I'm sorry, upper left for you, uh, is th that I was flying the A-4 Echo in an adversary role. And if you've ever seen Top Gun 1, there is supposedly a Top Gun 2 coming. Uh, with drones in it. I'm so excited. Uh, so, uh, but, but they'll make the human win out in the end because that's the human speed. That, you know, that's how, what makes good movies. Uh, so so I, I've been flying in a, in a fighter pilot role several years prior to the combat exclusion law being repealed in 1994. And that's what opened the doors for women to come in. And I was in that first group. And the A-4 that I flew prior to that was like an all-manual aircraft. It was me flying the aircraft. I did everything. Every hour that I have flown in that aircraft was all me. And then moving to the F-18 Hornet was like going from a Fiat to a Tesla. <laughs> and uh, the, the automation was just amazing. I had autopilot. I could, uh, even in some of the weaponry, you could have a lot of automated assistance. And, but it was not until um, I saw the carrier operations that I really started to appreciate what was about to happen to the human. 
When an F-18 lands on the carrier, they train you to do what they call mode one operations, which is really you touch just a couple of buttons, hands off, and the plane lands itself on the aircraft carrier. Better than you could every single time. And that's great from a safety standpoint, but prior to that, you know, I had spent, I had already been in the Navy about six years, and they had told me that I was the best of the best. You know, the real reason that I was superior to everyone in this room, I can assure you. <laughs> of course, you know, and it's funny because as a professor at MIT and at Duke, you know, it, there's a lot of smart people around me. And whenever I'm feeling a little insecure, I just remind myself, you know, these people have never landed a plane on an aircraft carrier. <laughs> but except, so you're really brainwashed. Um, you are the best of the best. I mean, that part of Top Gun, Top Gun is a silly movie in general, uh, but that part is correct. So I'm the best of the best, except I get to the aircraft carrier, and I'm not better than the computer on the landing. And not only was I not better at the computer on the landing, but when F-18 pilots take off, you have to show, there's a launch director, so you're, you're pointed at the end of the boat, you have to show them, everybody on the left side of the plane, I'm not touching anything. Everybody on the right side of the plane, seriously not touching anything. Mm -hmm. And then you put your hands on these launch bars up here where everyone can see them, and then they launch you off the front. So you are not even allowed to touch anything, huh. and you have to prove that you're not touching anything. And the reason that that is is because if you touch something, it's very likely you could cause the plane to crash because the automation is so finely honed. So that actually sat even less well with me. I was like, ah. I'm not even supposed to touch anything. So if, if I'm not supposed to touch anything, and it's, it takes itself off better than I can, and I'm, I'm a danger, and it lands itself better than I can, then why am I actually here? And at the time, it was because, well, somebody's actually got to do the fighter, the bomber part. You know, somebody's actually got to do the mission. So that, that was kind of enough for me to say, okay, my job is secure, until the missile in the bottom started to come online. The missile in the bottom is a Tomahawk missile, and in the picture you're seeing it's launched from a submarine from under the water a thousand miles from its target. And it has less than a meter precision accuracy. There's no fighter pilot alive, even with um, all the automated assist in an aircraft that has consistently less than a meter precision accuracy. And, and it's funny, these two sides of the Navy were completely separate at the time, because the sea side of the Navy doesn't really talk to the aviation side of the Navy. They hate each other, you know? But uh, I actually saw what was gonna happen, and I, and I looked around and I said, oh my God, when this missile, actually, when the rest of the Navy starts to realize that this missile is so precise, I mean, honestly, human error is huge in these domains, and you, you know, you, ha you have a lot of, accidents at the aircraft carrier, I have lost more friends than I can remember in terms of people who have died in carrier operations. And it's, it's a no-brainer. If we could get, if, the, if you can land the planes, take them off, and actually be much more accurate in weapons delivery, you don't have a job. And so I, could, I, see it, I saw it coming, and at the same time, I was one of the first female fighter pilots, and the guys really hated me. I, I can, you can go get my book for free on the internet uh, that I wrote about it. And uh, they just did not like me. So I made a big, I call it a big girl decision. I said, you know, I did it for three years. I flew these for three years. Uh, and I said, you know, I, I want to be on the other side of this coin. I want to be, I see where this is going. I see all the automation. And I, I had a lot of friends dying. And I said, there's got to be a better way. We've got to be able to design these systems better and safer than what we have today. And that's why I went back and got my PhD. So I'm actually a rare academic who has a real story to tell you behind why I became an academic. And I think that's actually been critical to my success. Had I not had all this time in aviation, I don't think I would have had the insight that I have. And then I created the Humans and Autonomy Lab uh, at Duke, formerly the Humans and Auto Automation Lab at MIT. And there is a joke, an implicit joke in that name, but you have to be really over the age of 40 to get it. <laughs> so I will let all of you young pups in the room who do not get the joke behind the name, you have to go ask somebody older in the room. <laughs> okay, so let me tell you about, you know, this is more of an, an academic flavor. I'm not going to get too, too deep in the weeds, um, but just to kind of give you a sense of the official research title behind it, it's called Human Supervisory Control. It's where you've got a human right here who's trying to do, execute some very complex remote task with a computer that sits in the middle. So in this case, there's a, this is a drone operator flying an army drone, but they're not actually directly flying it. They're sending in some computer program uh, requests, and the computer translates that, and then the computer changes what's happening on the aircraft. But this is not really, I mean, you know, this is, you see it a lot in, in um, 
military aviation. Oh, by the way, this is how every single commercial aircraft is flown too. The pilot in today's aircraft are, is not connected to the controls, meaning when the pilot pushes forward, we say houses get bigger, houses get smaller. The pilot's just saying, plane, I want you to go down. And then the plane computes and checks all the surfaces and checks the systems. And then the plane says, all right, I'll let you go down. Maybe. <laughs> Maybe. If you're an Airbus, there's actually some buffers in there to keep you from crashing. And so um, it's actually what we call flying by voting, which is sometimes a little scary. But aviation is not the only place you see this in. This is a robotic forklift that I worked on while I was at MIT. It's a robotic forklift that's much better than any of the Kiva Amazon systems that you see in nice, well-controlled warehouses. This is a robot that can go into fields and sand and mud and dirt for the Army. And the reason they need robotic forklifts is to keep people from being killed while they're doing warehousing, Army, Army people specifically. This is another big project I'm working on. This is a dump truck that's in a mine. This is my student right here. Little, little guy right there. That's how big these are. This is completely automated. And the robotic trucks in the mines have been a huge boon for the mining industry. First of all, they can't get enough drivers because in these remote locations, they have a hard time bringing people in. But not only that, you don't have to worry about people oversleeping or not sleeping enough or drinking or fighting. And these robot trucks always do their mission. They're always very precise. They are so precise in these mines that they have to program in some uncertainty as they're driving down the road because they will drive so precisely over the same track every single time that they actually create these big ruts in the road <laughs> that then become very safe for man vehicles to drive around. So they actually have to program them to have a little bit more variation in them. We have the medical world is, um, so robo I, in fact, one of the industries that I give more talks to probably than any is the medical community because we're starting to see this is an automated tumor ablation um, device. So instead of surgery where somebody would cut into you, this is actually coming out of Israel right now. They will wheel you in. The system, kind of like an MRI, basically margins your tumors, and then, but it's all done automated. So the automation can get in there and very precisely hit where that tumor is. And all the radiologists really, it, they just say, you know, de um, delete tumor now. And that's all they do, and then it's done, right? And so it's starting to bring up, you know, and we think about pilots as, as these experts that we can never replace, and now we're starting to see doctors who, you know, they're, they're not going to be replaced anytime soon, but there's certainly aspects of medication, uh, of medicine that are going to be automated. And then last but not least, coming to a road near you, the Google car, or the, any driverless car, uh, and if you were my talk the other night, um, I'm actually a pro-driverless car fan because you're all terrible, terrible drivers. <laughs> Uh, and, and the younger you are, the likely it is that you're a worse driver because you have an expectation of information on demand all the time and you actually get a little bit more bored than older people do. And it's fact, in fact, who should, the only people we should allow to drive are knitters because it turns out knitters have really great attention focus. Uh, but for the most part, humans are terrible drivers and the more telematics and technology we get in the cars, the worse we're going to get. Uh, the problem with this is that driverless cars, and we'll talk a little bit more in a second about why that is, they are, of all these technologies, they are the farthest from development. You know, we see a lot of, of upheaval, social upheaval about drones. Drones are a tomorrow technology, actually a today technology with advanced drones tomorrow. Driverless cars are a really distant tomorrow technology. Okay, but let me explain to you why that is. I'm going to give you some of my trade secrets right here. So what this all comes down to is something called the role allocation debate. What should the computer be doing and what should the human be doing? This is not a new problem. This is basically from the early days of NASA. This picture, this is on the Apollo missions. The engineers at NASA could not figure out. So, so should we automate as much as we can? And the, the, if you can see it, they're smoking. The astronauts are smoking and just waiting to hit the abort button, which kind of shows you where we were in the 50s with smoking, right? Uh, <laughs> that, that NASA was like, oh yeah, our astronauts, they could smoke. Uh, or should we have them been doing, doing a lot in the loop? I will actually tell you, I work a lot with NASA. NASA has still not solved this problem. And it turns out that there's some interesting cultural problems at NASA because we still very hold, we're holding on very tightly to manned missions. And so we spend, this country spends a obscene amount of money doing missions that robots really should be doing. And we'll show you why in a second that they should be doing it. I'm not saying we shouldn't have a manned exploration of space, but you know, it's, it's, 
arguable whether or not we should be spending the resources that we are. Now that was the 1950s view. This is the 2010-ish view, and this is coming from the roboticist of the world, right? So this is how roboticists today see the world, that robots should be doing everything and there should be a human in case of an emergency, please break the glass, right? And it's funny because um, it really, you know, roboticists see the human, most roboticists, not all, see the human as a very negative part of the problem. They are a disturbance in the system that needs to be controlled. I mean, that's almost an exact quote. As opposed to understanding that there could be some kind of collaborative relationship between humans, which is really what my talk is all about. It really should not necessarily be one of mutual exclusion as the 1950s or the 2010. We really got to find a better collaborative space. But how do you know what that is? So a few years ago, a couple years ago, I came up with something, uh, came up with this graph based on something called the SRK taxonomy which is the skills, rule, and knowledge-based taxonomy. It's derived from a researcher, Jens Rasmussen, in the Netherlands. But what he says, what he'll tell you is that humans reason basically on three levels. You have skills, and I'll talk in a minute what that is, rules, knowledge. And then I went and then added a couple of things. I said, okay, well, actually, there's something else beyond knowledge. You, knowledge is pretty much domain specific, but then you can actually rise up to the level of expertise. And that's really what we're after. And it's not necessarily how much you know, but what is the expert judgment that's going on in the system? But that's actually contingent on something called uncertainty. How much do we know about the world? How, uh, how much do, can we say for sure that certain events are going to happen? And I'll, I'll wrap that back in a second so you understand that. And this is basically the slider of balance. And I'm going to explain, you know, right now we're on this lower end where computers are dominant and on the higher end humans are dominant. Now let, let me tell you why that is. So this is a picture of an aircraft cockpit. So why is it that drones are actually better pilots than humans? And in fact, about a year and a half ago, the Air Force reached a new milestone in that it became safer for the Air Force and the rest of the military to send a drone on a fighter-bomber mission than a manned aircraft, meaning you're more likely to have an accident if you've got a human in it. Why is that? There's a lot going on. When you go to flight school, you basically spend two years in flight school learning to keep the plane from falling out of the sky. And that's because you have to rehearse that set of skills. You have to learn to balance the wings and how to do coordinated turns and how to go down and up without getting your speed out of control, how to keep it from stalling. And this is actually something in Air France a, a few years ago that the pilots missed that in training. They didn't understand how to keep the plane from stalling. And these are all basic skills. So we spend the majority of our time in flight training getting humans to be very automated in their execution of the skills. And that's what makes a pilot a pilot today. And in fact, you know, I, I could probably jump in at any plane, you know, if I was in a commercial airplane and the pilot, you know, collapsed, both pilots collapsed, I could get up there and land it. It wouldn't be pretty, but um, it's a, it's a skill set that once you learn, you actually kind of understand it, but it takes a long time to learn. Computers do this, you know, effortlessly. They don't have to spend two years going to flight school, and they don't have attention problems. They don't have, if you were the other night, uh, we were talking about, you know, we actually have a problem in cockpits when they're taxiing, in planes, um, texting while taxiing. I mean, we're, we're, it's, so, it's, such a, it's such a powerful draw that even pilots who are highly trained get bored in what they're doing. After you've been taxiing a plane for 20 years, it's boring, right? And so we have some other socio-technical issues that get wrapped into um, why our skill sets degrade. All right, so automation, it turns out if you can figure out what a skill-based task is, for the most part today, you can automate that in all kinds of domains. And, and so for the act of driving, it's pretty good. You know, we know how to keep a car on the road. We know how, how to see, sense the size of the road and how to keep the speed regulated and how to keep a car driving. But what about rule-based reasoning? Rule-based reasoning happens when there's some external stimuli in the world and you've got to figure out what that means and then you adjust the vehicle or the plane accordingly. So when you're in a car, you see that red sign coming, you know that theoretically about you know, 30 feet ahead, you need to start slowing down so you can come to a stop, full brake stop, and then you either go on or take a turn, whatever. So you learn the driving rules and you learn how it has to adjust your behavior to, to go with those rules. You know, so, uh, and this is what you're seeing up here, procedures. It turns out aviation is a highly proceduralized environment. That's really just a bunch of rules. And you have to, there's some rules that you have to learn by heart, but any time you ever have to reduce something, a skill or a, any kind of behavior for a human to memory, that's dangerous because humans have very imperfect memory. And, and it's not necessarily age dependent. Sometimes older people can have better memories than younger people, depending on the kind of memory that you're accessing. Uh, and then we get up to knowledge-based reasoning, where 
This is where, and, the, and you'll see, this is commensurate with uncertainty growing. You need knowledge-based reasoning, which is really something we call judgment under uncertainty. Something went wrong. My rules, the, the person who wrote the rule book never thought that this would happen. And I have to adapt on the fly. So basically, contingency planning on the fly is what knowledge-based reasoning is. And you see this, I've got this picture of the miracle on the Hudson. This is a great example of knowledge-based reasoning. You know, he didn't, Chesley Sullivan didn't have, there were no, you know, they, they, he knew what to do with an engine flame out, but he never got the restart. Then he's, it's not, art, it's not clear whether or not he could have made a runway. He had to go for the ditching. Lots of uncertainty, lots of, and then, and this is where the experience was basically a feedback loop into this. It's likely that he was so calm under pressure because he had done this over and over. I mean, he was a seasoned pilot. And this is as a person who's getting older, I like to think, ah, yeah, that's the one good thing about getting older is that experience and wisdom actually do increase as you get older and you see more events and you're able to process. You, you basically do a sense of pattern matching in your head and you're generally more adaptable to novel events as you get older under these highly trained complex systems operations. So. Where does automation sit here? Well, this expertise and knowledge is very much a human-driven domain right now. Computers cannot reason well under uncertainty, even under uh, very uh, low, uh, what we would say simple uncertainty. So there was a, a research effort that came out of Stanford recently that got a lot of press where a researcher had his algorithms watch YouTube and identify whether or not there was a cat or not in the picture. Now this is effortless for you. I show you a picture. I show a six month old a picture and cat, no cat. They, you generally get it 100% right. So there was a lot of press. This guy said, oh, I got my YouTube algorithms to, to, to do this. And it turned out, yes, they could do it, but only 16% of the time. I said 1 6 percent of the time, not 60, 16%. And, and the world went crazy. The machine learning pattern recognition world went crazy because that was the best that had ever been happened. 16%, you're better off flipping a coin, right? So, so we're at the, the state of the art today, the latest and the greatest coming out of academia is that we've got an algorithm that can recognize a cat 16% of the time. We are not going to be encroaching on um, knowledge-based reasoning anytime soon. But let me show you how that pl plays out for automated systems. So at MIT, one of the things I became famous for, which ended up, this is, this is once you get on the Colbert Report, then that, then that leads to the Daily Show, and then I guess at least to 60 Minutes, you know, so, um, which is funny, I have to tell you, once you're on the Daily Show, your students could care less whether or not you win the Nobel Prize, because that becomes your marked achievement of your life. <laughs> So, uh, but, but what, what got me on the media map was is that we took an iPhone and we made it an iPhone app that allowed you, anybody in this room could do it, and within three minutes you would be successfully controlling the drone. So, and this actually got me on the pilots map, the um, uh, Association of uh, Professional Pilots, because then they got really mad at me because they saw where I was going with this. It's like, you know, if, you can, if I can train anybody in this room to be a pilot in three minutes, why do you need commercial pilots? And uh, um, so, that, but we were able to do that because we automated all those skills. Now, this, this system doesn't, it doesn't do anything about air traffic control. It's not, a, it's not a high level. It's only, we only automated the skill level, right? And that's why it's so easy to pick up. But if you ever needed to do anything complex, it would be a, probably a different story. But by complex, I mean, well, okay, so this just allows you to fly it locally. You know, I don't want to say go spy on your neighbor, but you know, whatever you're going to do with that, with that, with that system. Then we've got the logistics. So that is where we're going to need rule-based reasoning because all of these drones that Amazon, and by the way, Amazon gets all the credit for doing the um, cargo, but they're not the first. They're not even close to being the first. There's a company called Zucal in Australia that's doing textbook delivery. They're way further along in the regulatory process than Amazon is. And even China came out with an announcement that they were going to do um, package delivery via drones way earlier than Amazon did. So this is not just a unique US uh, approach. But to do that, you're actually going to have to figure out, it's actually not the actual of flying, because as we showed here at MIT, the actual act of flying is that can be pushed over to the automation really easily. And it, we can actually, and we've got some clever algorithms get, that can figure out where the drones should go and how they should deconflict. But the problem is not what happens in a normal world, but what happens in an abnormal world. What happens if, a, if weather comes in unexpectedly? What happens if an airplane, a manned aircraft, has to make an emergency landing and has to come down through a sea of swarms, right? Uh, uh, these swarming, you know, packages going everywhere. So we have to figure out what all the, ru the rules, the rule-based system that's going to have to go along with that. 
And then at the top of the conundrum here is the Google car. The Google car is going, before it's actually going to really be able to be let loose in the world, it's going to have to demonstrate that it has not just knowledge, but expert-based reasoning. And why is that, right? So the classic, you're driving along and a ball rolls out in the street, you know to look one way or the other or look around because there's some kids going on, okay? There, the, the Google car can see all the same world that you can. It has the sensors, it detects the ball. In fact, it probably saw these things, but saw before you did because it was able to detect them. But the real, that's right, the real key is then what happens next, right? This is inductive abstract reasoning where this is not a place where computers can live right now. So the engineers, um, and, I, and I work with Google a lot, and they will tell you, uh, well, we'll just, we'll just put in every case. We'll just get, we'll figure out, and we'll be able to, to basically codify every single event that might be happening. And the question is, there, there's no way. We've been, in the, we've been trying to automate the aviation world all for, you know, what, almost 100 years, and we still haven't quite gotten there. So I still think, you know, this is why, why I told you before, drones, easy. The drone world is going to grow fantastically in the next few years. Probably not here so much as in the rest of the world, which is actually good. I, I, I think the drone issue, particularly in the commercial civilian applications, kind of like Sputnik. This country did not take the space program seriously until the Russians beat us to it. Right? So I think the same thing is going to happen with drones. We're going to see lot Australia, South Africa, other countries be much more um, progressive in terms of drone operations, and then we'll get into the race. So what about the future? I love the Jetsons because I want the robot made. You know, I'm a single mom. I need a robot made. I need a robot car. I need a robot everything in my life. And it's funny, when we see these, we think of these two things. If you haven't seen the Jetsons, go look at them on YouTube. We've got Rosie, the made robot. And then we've got basically your own little personal drone. Which of these two things is going to happen first? The personal drone. That's actually in development right now. So there, there are two companies working on your own personal drone. Um, right now you can buy a, a prototype that you have to fly yourself for $300,000. You know, there's probably a few people in Aspen that could, could you know, uh, <laughs> get, get that. But for the most, the rest of us, you know, and by the way, uh, you still have to be a certified pilot. So we will not have our own personal flying craft until we can get you out of the flying, the pilot seat too. You're terrible drivers, and you would be worse pilots. You know, I just. Need, <laughs> but this is a rea this is a reality, and I wrote an article for Scientific American saying within the next 50 years, this is a reality for us, um, on on a larger scale. This still really, really hard, really hard because of that cat problem I told you about, getting th the expectation of sensors, having a robot work with you and understand all your nuances, much less dexterity, being able to pick up a plate and then put it into a shelf. And this is what I want my robot to do. I want my robot to take the dishes out of the dishwasher and put them, in, put them away. We're not even close to that right now. There's one robot out there from Willow Garage that, that was developed for about 300 plus thousand dollars that can fold a towel. And that was like the big, the big deal. But that's all that robot can do. The robot can only fold the towel. So if you need a towel folding robot, and you know, there may be some linen places could, but for the rest of us who want Rosie the maid, we're still pretty far from that. All right, so I thought I'd turn it back over to Megan now. Lovely, thank you so much, that was wonderful. <laughs> so let's, let's start with, so you mentioned that you will need the pilot's license um, to fly for these. Now. For now. Okay, so, so let's talk a little bit about the sort of regulation aspects of all of this. Um, Robert Callow the other night um, suggested an idea of a federal agency for um, regulating robots, basically. What do you think of that idea? Do you think that's feasible? Do you think that we need to be very sort of proactive about oversight of it right now? I, I don't think we need any more government than we have right <laughs> now. I mean, I don't mean to sound like a libertarian, but uh, we've already got the federal aviation who's going to take care of the air side of it. And all the, uh, who, you know, NHTSA, the highway transportation, they're going to take care of the ground side, the transportation side. The Federal Railroad Administration is, by the way, this is something that's embarrassing for this country. We are so far behind in automated trains. There are third world nations that have better train services than we do in this country, right? And, um, and we could have another long discussion. I need, next year I should come back and give, give you all the three letter agencies and who I think are the most screwed up and why. Because <laughs> uh, the FRA, you know, I, I bash the FAA all the time, but the FRA has gotten up there in terms of dysfunction. Uh, <laughs> What's uh, the absolute worst, I've got to ask? Oh. Uh -huh. 
Okay. <laughs> oh, but it could change any day. It depends on the, you know the, the new technology. Uh, okay. So um, so I and 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 as far as the consumer, you know, we have consumer protection agencies, you know, so, so I think that if we, and we, there's actually another um, agency that we have that does um, measures, NIST, the um, instrumentation standards, you know, and they're actually doing a lot in um, assessing robots. So I think we have more than enough government oversight. I will tell you the biggest problem of, of ha we have all the right agencies in place, but we do not have really very good people inside the agencies. Um, I took a leave of absence for a couple of years as a professor to work inside the military. I ran a $100 million robotic helicopter program for them. And, but, I, but while inside the government, I worked for them. I worked with NIST, NIST, NHTSA, most of the other big agencies. And I walked away thinking, this country is in such deep trouble in the future. Because I think that there are so few people inside of all those agencies that have the academic background and the ability to kind of see all the problems and in terms of testing and assessment. This country is woefully inadequate in being able to have people set forth policies that are actually based on the technology and the requirements as opposed to an emotional fear. And this is what's happening with the FAA. The FAA is an agency that's very old. In fact, most of the regulatory agencies, you'll find out, I mean, there's some recent articles, the government cannot hire young people. And so they're like a 50 and over top heavy crowd. And as I'm quickly approaching on that, you know, I, I, I sense that, you know, oh man, am I, when am I going to be obsolete here? Because those people, they, their skill set does not match at all what the skill set that is needed today. But the government cannot hire that skill set because that skill set is going to work for Google, Oracle, Apple, not even the defense industry. This, you, this country is in deep, deep trouble in the defense in terms of robots. Google just bought all the top robotic companies in the world, one of which was Boston Dynamics, which was the US military's powerhouse robot and I'll, uh, company. And I'll tell you what Google is going to do. And I, I actually gave this same talk in front of a Google um, VP, and he said, yep, that's what we're going to do. Uh, they're going to, they, they, by law, they have to let their military, they have to finish their military contracts, and that's going to be that. Huh. Turns out there is no money in military robotics. And, and it's hard, I think, it was hard for me to get my head around that first, because you think, oh, billions and tens and hundreds of millions of dollars going in these robotic programs. Turns out the commercial world, the worldwide market, it's so much more lucrative. And that's what Google wants. Google doesn't want to deal with the military who's got all kinds of regulations and rules and difficulties when they can go service the world market and make a lot more money. Can I do a quick follow-up? Please do, yeah. I'm sorry to yeah. interrupt. Yeah. So um, just, just a, a clarification, because I just um, respect your, your viewpoint and, and, and really enjoy your, your comments. Um, so if we don't do like a Federal Robotics Commission, right, um, where it's a standalone agency and it's robotics, right? I wonder how we would go about amassing the relevant expertise in each of these individual places. I mean, historically, right, the story is um, there's a new technology, we want to get expertise. I mean, every ounce of administrative law is all about respecting the expertise of these places. They're this place where they could be. And so it's like, oh, I'm sorry. Um, and so if it's, if, it's, if it's not a standalone agency, maybe NASA turns into the Federal Robotics Commission, right? Um, and, and you have to actually recruit the FAA. Every, is it going to be sexy enough? Are we ever going to be able to do that? I mean, I, I'm, I'm totally sensitive to the idea of like, do we really need another three or four letter agency? Um, but I'm, I'm deeply skeptical that the Securities and Exchange Commission will bone up on algorithms and the FAA will, will figure out autonomy and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And that's why I would argue that we it, need It's a, a great question. Agency. And I actually, I have a name, uh, I have a seat with my name on it, back and forth to DC <coughs> from Raleigh Durham. Uh, because I do do a lot of consulting for the government, working with the OSD, the Office of the Secretary of Defense, and actually some OSTP, some th some of the bigger agencies. And so, it the problem with trying to have one central agency is you actually need to have a lot of domain expertise to really be able to get in the weeds across that. I mean, for for drones, you really need to be you need to have a strong aviation background as well as the robotics background. And that set of skills is not exactly the same as you need to have your Roomba for example, right? And so there are very, and you need to be tightly coupled with those regulatory agencies because that's a, that's a continual feedback loop. I will tell you probably the, the agency that would have been ideal for this 
was a, an agency that this government did away with many years ago called the OTA, the Office of Technology Assessment. Yeah. And so I would actually tell you it's not robotics. I don't think we should have anything special in robotics, but we do have initiatives in this country like the National Robotics Initiative, right? So there are lots of people trying to come together at the national level. I say we need to go back and bring back Office of Technology Assessment because it's not just robots. We have all kinds of new automation coming into nuclear reactors. I do a lot of work with the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. And the automation that is in very safety critical systems in, mar in the maritime industry, in drilling, oil, energy, the energy management system. I tell you what, well, we got a big problem coming. When we put hook everybody up on the grid, we have no idea how everybody on an individual level, changing their own thermostats to either take in or take out, you know, depending on your energy source, how that's going to distribute across the country. You really have no clue, right? So that's why I don't think a, a robotic specialty is needed as much as we need to go back to how do we figure out whether or not these systems are good or bad. I'm a big fan of capitalism. We've got to let the system work for itself, but the government should serve as the checks and balances. Is this system ready to be deployed, right? Like NHTSA. Are these driverless cars ready to go? I'll tell you what, you know what app I want? I want the app that lets me know that there's a driverless car near me and I want to get away from that. You know, I'm a person, I'm a person who's in this industry and uh, I don't want one near me because they are, in my estimation, they are so unreliable, yet there are states in this country that have said, yeah, you can have them on the road and you don't have any informed consent out there that you're, that you're on the road with them. Interesting. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Um, we're going to move to that in just a minute. Yeah, don't worry, I'll give you guys plenty of time for that. Yeah, I want to I want to get into sort of the cultural elements of things as well. I keep thinking of Google's driverless cars and how they insisted on putting a smiley happy face on those cars when they rolled them out in the in the current prototype. Um, what do you think about that as applied to drones? Um, so the word I, drone, first of all, and yeah, yeah. So that. I've got this great paper, an old paper, by the way. It's like, gosh, I wrote it in two thousand three, and um, people it. it you know, 11 years ago, it got no airplay, but now it's starting to get picked up. I talked about it's the moral buffer of technology. And so I kind of, in my research, I came across, um, for that Tomahawk missile, I came across a mission planning tool that was unbelievably um, able, I could actually show the screenshots to the public. And I went public with them and I said, so you've got to see what these missile, um, their salvo strike mission planning. And so it'd be like, okay, here's my target and here are the coordinates, and here are all the weapons that I want to go. It's like a big Excel spreadsheet. And at the end, a little dog pops up with a little happy face and little, little ears that make it all like, and it's like, OK, do you want to launch this strike? Yes, no. Like, it's like this happy dog. And like, you hit that button, and then people die, right? I mean, that's, that's the reality of it. And I was, like, I was just offended, because I, was actually I had just left the military. And you know, I got my game face on. I'm like, let's at least put a growl on that dog. Let's get a mean dog out there. You know, we're about to go to war here. We don't need a happy dog. And so that actually, and then I ended up, um, half my PhD is in engineering, and half is actually in philosophy, because that got me so interested in how is it that we're making these killing machines with these happy faces on them? And these weren't military people who designed it. These were civilians, just like many people, software developers in this room. Because it makes us feel better, right? So we like it. So there's this whole psychology of if we put a happy face on this technology, somehow that will actually change the way we feel about it. Now, I'm not saying that the Google car is, this, is equivalent to a Tomahawk missile. <laughs> But the fact of the matter is robots, you know, have, with drones especially, have taken on a very negative view in, in not just this country but around the world. And you can almost singularly point to the use of drones to do targeted assassinations by the CIA. It's not even the military does not do those missions. The CIA does those missions. And in fact, I just sat on a national um, commission um, working with many four-star and three-star generals. We just re released the report on Thursday from the Stimson Center that basically says the government is really engaging in some um, very nebulous practices by killing people under cloaks of secrecy via the CIA, who's basically running amok with these weaponized systems, and there's a, there is blowback to that, right? So, but, but kind of back to your point about, so we know that these, that these technologies can take on a negative persona. And they weren't really intended to. We will see so much good done with drones. The helicopter that I told you about that I was working on with the military, it's a helicopter designed to be called by an iPhone app for soldiers in the field to deliver a helicopter that will take somebody who, for example, got a bullet chest to the a bullet wound to the chest, who will die inside that hour because it's called a golden hour. If you get that somebody to a trauma unit within an hour, the chances of survival are exponentially greater. So that helicopter can get there into 
bad weather, places that manned helicopters can't go, pick that person up and get them to a trauma unit. The military will lead the way. These systems will be first responder systems one day. They will be the systems going into Haiti. They will be the systems going into earthquake areas, right? So one day, robots are going to be critical to saving lives. Unfortunately, we've got this negative persona about it. I think a little bit of that has spilled over to the driverless car. But, but there's also, um, and if you heard the other night, this idea of the uncanny valley. We actually do not, for the most part, I cannot wait to get a driverless car, but only when all the other ones are driverless car, right? It's actually the mixed, the mixing of manned and unmanned cars, which makes it so dangerous. But once, let's say, everybody's plugged into the grid and all the cars can talk to each other, I think that's great because I'm really busy. But, <laughs> but if you actually go out and poll your average American, they don't, they're not crazy about giving up driving. We hate traffic jams and we might want the traffic jam robot but there's still a love of the, the act of driving and being in control. And so I think that's one of the reasons Google, you know, we're going to put the smiley face. And I, I would have loved to set in on the meetings of all the icons that you could have used to, to make people feel good about that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, right. But, you know, I, I do think it's, it is a psychological <clears throat> tool to try to get people to buy into the system. But I think Google like many companies like Google, um, you know, if you just look at Google Glass, I mean, they kind of, I think they kind of missed the boat there because they didn't understand the social interactions. And it's the same thing about the social interactions of the car. It's going to take a lot more than a smiley face to get, to get you happy with it. But I tell you what, when they get that tra traffic jam feature, let's say you're in your car, you're driving your car most of the time, and then you can hit, okay, I'm in a traffic jam, <laughs> just do the inching ahead, and I'm going to work on my laptop, I'm going to watch a movie. When that feature comes out, that'll be a bestseller. Hmm. And do you think there's a role for the pop culture to play? I mean, we've got the Jetsons on the screen. You mentioned Top Gun 2. Um, and there are so many instances you can think of where you know, popular culture actually did affect just people's general opinions. Do you think that there's a role to play there as well? Or oh, yeah. I mean, you just have to look at your cell phone to see you know, from the Star Trek. And there's you know, those interesting um, publications about all the technologies we have today because people envisioned it through science fiction. I'm a big science fiction fan, and so I absolutely think pop culture plays a big part of it. But there, it's kind of a feedback loop because pop culture generally, in, in whatever topic, gets big because of a younger generation. And it's true. I mean, this is research that we see in my lab over and over again. It, it is true that the older you get, on average, you get less tolerant of new technology. And so the younger generation is very technology savvy and um, absorbing. I would say not necessarily a good way. I'm not a real big fan of Facebook. I don't have a Facebook page, um, but you know my students and you know when my six year old grows up, we're gonna you know really screen that Facebook page. You know, and they, they these apps that like you show up in the city and let everybody know where you are. I just I cannot imagine doing that, right? <laughs> But the younger generation can. And I, I heard the funniest thing. I was in this meeting, and there was a, a three-star general. He came into this meeting. He says, you are not going to believe this. I was stuck in this airport with my teenage daughter. And uh, we were sitting there. We were going to be stuck there for several hours. And the next thing I know, she was sitting with three of her friends. She was on one of those apps. And in, a, in an instant, she had a party at the airport. And he was just, it was his, it was, you know, this, this, it was so funny to hear him say this, to say, like, here's a man who's been commanding armies across the world, and he just could not get his brain around the fact that a 60-year-old daughter was sitting in an airport with her friends. That's excellent. Okay, so I will turn it over to you guys now. I'm going to ask um, if you could just um, actually use that microphone, since we're filming, just to, to pick up your voices. So if you guys don't mind, if you have a question just lining up in front of that, um, I'll ask Missy one more question and then turn it over to you. Um, so I'd love to get into the ethics element of this a little bit. So um, where in the sort of skills, knowledge, um, rules and expertise framework does ethics fit in? Does it sort of, you know, go over everything? How do we sort of program ethics into our algorithms? It's, it's a great question because there are some researchers, Ron Arkin at Georgia Tech um, is the, probably the biggest proponent, who will tell you he can train a more ethical robot mm -hmm. than a human. And I am vehemently against that because, you know, I've been there. I've seen the mistakes that can happen. I also know those cat YouTube videos, you know, that, those algorithms are terrible. And, and in, in my mind, you know, particularly when we talk about killing, uh, I believe a human should always be responsible for killing another human, right? That's just me, and not everybody agrees with that. Uh, and so, the, the, but the whole ethics, you know, so the ethics of, well, then you've got to make sure that your sensors, um, at the skill, can you actually acquire all the information that you need? Can you have a high, so it's really more related. I think the ethics and the uncertainty axis that you saw before, they are linked, c tightly coupled. Because if you have high uncertainty, the question is, can you be certain 
that if you're about to pull the trigger or if you're going to put a driverless car on the road or any of these other technologies, how certain are you that that technology is going to behave in a predictable way, at least as close to a human, if not superior to a human in terms of reaction times and, and those kinds of mistakes. And so um, it's a growing field that you can actually now get degrees in ethics and autonomous systems. And so we're on it. You know, I think this country has actually moved very quickly and it's a really, really hot topic now. I, I actually had to do a lot of consulting overseas to um, Geneva, London, you know, some agencies where people are actually trying to uh, formalize what we should put together as policies. Okay, great, thank you. All right, so come on up. Um, if you don't mind just saying your name, who you are first, and then... My name is it. Pat Besser, I'm from Chicago. Missy, given the, your description on the slide a few uh, slides ago of how the computer second guesses pilots on commercial flights, what happened to the Malaysian airline flight? That's a great, I get, I get that question a lot. Um, this is my personal opinion. I don't have any ins insider knowledge than anybody else probably has. But it looks to me like a classic oxygen problem in the aircraft where there's some kind of slow degradation of the oxygen and it's um, hypoxia and you don't, it's not obvious to pilots who are actually trained to recognize it. It's very insidious. And, and what you do is every, you just, you have less and less oxygen and then just eventually everybody just drops off to sleep. And then the aircraft, there, we have had numerous aircraft in the last 30 years that this has happened to, and they all just kind of fly off on some random direction. Uh, and there's some question about the, you know, the, to, in my mind, the transponder, the, the location of it was a big question. But it's also very possible that if there was some kind of electrical problem that caused the oxygen system to fail, most failures happen, multiple failures happen together. It's rarely just an individual failure. And then, so it's very likely that, that there was also something else, some electrical short out somewhere that potentially potentially cause both problems to happen together. That's my, that's my best guess. Uh, th those are some deep parts of the ocean out there and very, very hard to, very hostile. I, one day we might find some wreckage, um, but I do not think at all that this was something necessarily preventable in terms of a terrorism act. You know, and, and we talk about, well, if drones were so good, why, you know, a drone, if, if that had been a drone, it would have landed itself somewhere. And so, in fact, this is, I, I say that, that event highlights to me two things. First of all, drones should have been on the scene immediately to do the, both in the air and under the water, to do the search and rescue. They did not bring them in until too late, and there was, and there's a lot of political upheaval that caused that. And number two, if that had been a more automated aircraft that was on its own flight trajectory and was able to have these, the reasoning that we are, that people are working on to put an aircraft today, it would have found somewhere to land. Now, the people probably would have been dead it would have landed with basically a coffin, but at least we would have recovered the bodies. Really interesting, thank you. All right. Hi, uh, my name is Tom Wellington, and uh, I'm from LA. I actually I work in entertainment. Um, my question is sort of the flip side of pop culture. Do you think that the negative portrayals, you know, killer robots, terminators, all that, hold back beneficial types of automation? And also, how worried are you about a negative scenario like that. Yeah, I think it's absolutely true. I tell people if Hollywood would quit making movies where drones are tra chasing you down, uh, <laughs> that we would probably, you know, if Hollywood would make the movie where a drone saved your life, you know, we, we might see something different. And in fact, those, and I, and I think that that will come. I think we tend to get very US centric. We see the world through our eyes and through our media, but drones are not reviled the way that they are here everywhere else, right? You know, I certainly think in Afghanistan and Iraq, you know, the drones are, you know, Yemen, they're not pro drone. Uh, but if you go to places like Australia and South Africa and countries that with big distances, big logistics problems, Africa, drones, you would not, but I have a big conservation effort going on. I cannot get, I've got way too many. Um, African reserves who want to work with me to get drones to track rhinos, elephants, and tigers in the Himalayas, you know, and so, and so we've got the, you know, the use of drones everywhere else, I think, you know, is coming up because they don't have the same media barrage in terms of what sells. At the same time, you know, I mean, I have a lot of friends who are in the media, um, journalism, and let me tell you, right, the worst field you could go into right now in terms of ecologist journalism, because they're, the jobs out there are so hard to get. And they're, you know, it's, it's turned into, you gotta have a lot of media skills, I mean, multimedia skills. And so those people, they need to get that, the sexiest part of technology to sell. That's what sells magazines and newspapers and, you know. So, you know, I, I don't really begrudge them that, but at the same time, you know, I, I would like Hollywood to start, you know, using some more positive features. 
Hello, um, my name is Victor and I'm from Philadelphia. And the question I have, um, seeing this new technology, it seems really innovative and mind blowing. But my question is like, when, when we actually have access to them, how, how are we gonna deal with the issue of it getting into the wrong hands? Like if you have people like Bin Laden, if you have people like Kim Jong-un, like if they wanna cause mass terror in their countries, how do we, how do we deal with that issue because I know you it's one thing to say like we can keep it confidential like it'll never get to them but like look at America during the world war like they when they were developing the nuclear bomb they didn't think anyone was going to get to it until the Rosenbergs leaked it to them so that's my question it's a great question. It comes up a lot about, you know, what about negative uses of this technology? And I would tell you, you know, you have to first of all sit back and, and think that any technology is, can be used in good ways or bad ways. I think, the, to me, the best part of drones and manned aerial vehicles is the fact that we're seeing a true democratization of technology, meaning everyone can have it. You can get on the internet right now, go to DIY drones, do-it-yourself drones, get download plans, go to Radio Shack, and later today you could have yourself built a real drone, right? And that's great from a business aspect, and we're seeing the flourishing of businesses come up in this area, which is creating jobs, it's going to improve your quality of life. But like every technology, uh, we could, and I would say the best parallel is GPS. So when the military took off, the, the military used to have a, basically a filter on GPS technology, which would not really make it very useful to you. It was not very accurate for civilians who might have receivers. And then the military decided, I think in one of the best moves they ever made, to, to take off those locks. Because yes, do terrorists actually use GPS devices that they bought on the internet against us? Yes. And do they use airplanes? In fact, a drone is actually a very simple aircraft. It's actually not that much different than a small Piper little plane that you might see flying around here. And you can use those. You could you know, use those with a remote control and do devastating things. But in the end, you've got to look at the balance. GPS with no filters revolutionized the world that we live in today. Driverless cars would not even be a reality without that, right? Uh, so yeah. We have some bad, and we have to figure out locally for the individual pockets of problems that, that come up, how are we going to, to defend against that? But I'll tell you what that also means is more jobs. Because um, it turns out that driverless cars in this country are a good idea unless you go to Texas. And, uh, and I, I have a friend that I work with who's a researcher there. They, um, it, particularly in Austin, Anything that relies on GPS navigation is having a real problem because everybody in Austin is driving around with a GPS jammer in their trunk. This is a very paranoid culture who doesn't want anybody because there's GPS technologies that track truckers, anybody on deliveries, right? Because now we're, we have this Orwellian, you know, what companies can know where you are all the time. And so everybody's driving around with a GPS jammer to keep their boss from knowing where, what there is. The derivative, the derivative side effect is, Driverless cars are going to really struggle in, in these countries, uh, I mean, in these cities, as well as any drone who would be anywhere nearby. I mean, GPS jamming is a big, big problem, right? So, but that's, a, and now there's a whole new, so there was a whole new business sector that came up with GPS jamming, and now there'll be a whole new GPS sector of anti-jamming, right? So that's, I think that's the great thing about technology. One new development will always lead to more. Hi, great talk. Jim Pies is my name. Uh, last week I read uh, where an Iranian drone uh, went into Iraqi airspace, and I guess the, my question is about cognizance and, uh, you know, what what will happen drone on drone fighting? You know, will the, will the, the operator in Nevada get replaced by smarter drones? Uh, and uh, how do you see you know, we all look at, at mm -hmm. that cognizant thing mm -hmm. for the future. Yeah, drone on, it's a, uh, it's a great question. It's very futuristic. What about drone on drone warfare? Will we ever get to a place, and you could actually say robot on robot, you know, humanoids on the ground. And the answer is yes to all of those things. I mean, if you can envision it, it's possible. Uh, there are researchers right now in this country and abroad who are working on drone on drone warfare. It's actually not that difficult uh, because we, we've got the radars that we use in manned aircraft today have certain filters that, that, that have automated capability and it's only a human that is kind of the, the stop gap to, to make those fire. And so, yep, that's possible. I'm sure we will see it. And, uh, you know, you could argue 
once we get to a, a place, is that a better place or a worse place when we have robots that we launch to do all the killing and then everybody sits back with their Starbucks um, in a ground control station? So we'll see. You'll, you will see that probably in your lifetime. Missy Beth Sauerhaft, thanks for a, a really interesting uh, lecture. I think I want to come hear more of them. Um, can you talk a bit about the use of drones for agriculture and food production? Mm -hmm. Um, is that being done by the same groups who are doing the defense work? Mm -hmm. Where is it really being active? Yeah, that's actually, I think, uh, in, in my crystal ball, that's the next big explosion of drone technology, and it's critical because it's, um, it's what I call it, it's the grow chain, uh, which I derived from the military's kill chains. The military actually has, they love drones because it shortens the kill chain. We perceive the enemy, we uh, identify, we launch the weapon, and then we do, we get some feedback. I mean, that's how the kill chain is how the military, all the military works, regardless of what we're talking about. And so before drones, the kill chain could take days, sometimes even weeks to get all that information. And drones reduce the kill chain to minutes. But that's actually, that kill chain is the same thing as the grow chain for farmers. Because farmers, in the olden days, if they wanted to get uh, uh, pictures uh, of their crops, because you can actually get a lot from the frequencies, crop health, what crops are damaged, um, insects, droughts, all kinds of things. And they would have to spend weeks and lots of money. And getting access to satellites and other remote sensing devices is very difficult. And then, the, you know, it would take, by the time they got the data back, it's too late to do anything about the health of the crops. Today, we can shorten that down quite a bit. They can, farmers can launch their own UAVs, get an iPad, get that feedback where they need, and get the pesticides or not pesticides where they need in just the places they need very quickly. And so, and farmers, by the way, are having a terrible time getting all the, the physical labor that they need in these places. There are now robots on the ground that, it's funny, they actually go down rows of trees um, or whatever crops that need to be thinned, they actually drive themselves but we still need humans, basically migrant workers, to actually do the highly dexterous thinning of the trees. So it's, it's funny when you say the robot drives, nobody's driving the robot, and the workers are all thinning the trees as they go by, right? So, you, so and one day we will get the robot that can potentially thin the trees. And, and, and so we will be changing both the reduced prices of food, increased productivity, reduced use of pesticides. I mean, overall, it's an environment win-win. So there are dedicated companies uh, across the country, and I think that's, that's the one where you're seeing the most explosive growth. And the reason that you don't see it more often right now is because the FAA is holding everybody back. Okay. All right. Do you have one more question? And I think this will be our last one. Yep. I was hoping from a military perspective you could speak to uh, the reliance, if not uh, vulnerability of drones on uh, the United States satellite systems. Are we worried that drones could shoot down satellites? Well, if you have an operator in Kansas operating a drone over Afghanistan, it, it has to be relayed. Is it? Oh, or, yes. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. It has to be relayed via our satellite Yeah, so you're system. talking about the communication problem. Right. Yeah. So how reliant are we on communications? Um, that's a great question. Uh, in today's world, meaning the drones that are flying today, they are pretty reliant on the, on the signals that go up to the satellite and then down to the drone. I would say pretty reliant, though we, this country has experienced many failures of communications. And those drones, it's, it's kind of a price. The really expensive drones are equipped with this. Basically, um, they're smart enough to take themselves home and land. And we've had several global hawks, who have, which cost $40 million, you know, and we haven't lost any because they've been able to take themselves home. So that technology exists today, and, and again, just like most economic models, the more we use it, the more that price will come down. You know, the argument is, you know, if you wanted the drone to, you know, the smaller ones, the handheld ones, who cares if you lose those? You know, if, they're, if they cost $100, who cares if you lose them? I'll tell you, though, what's funny about the civilian world is, you, you know what the longest pole in the tent for Amazon is, it, minus the FAA? is do, you, do they really think, and I've actually given this talk to Amazon, what are you going to do when that thing lands in somebody's driveway and kids come get it, mm -hmm. right? I mean, this is, the, the security of drones, especially the small delivery drones, you know, and I come from Tennessee. My family in Tennessee would just as soon, they would wait for the package to be dropped off, and then as soon as it took off, they would shoot it, <laughs> right? They would want their stuff. But then it's just, hey, you know, we, I come from a skeet shooting family. We totally want to shoot it, right? So, so I think, you know, there's some other issues in terms of just basic security of the drones, not just the communication, which, which is a reality um, that we're going to have to worry about in the future. All right. 
Great. Well, well on that note, I think we are going to have to end. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank guys. you. Thank you.